Okay, well, um, we'll just see if, if more people end up showing up. Looks like we picked up one more in that minute. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started, and, and we can start here with this final exam uh, talk, uh, and that'll give other people a chance to enter in before problems are solved. So, um, yeah, so for the final exam, um, I did have a, a, sl a small poll that I wanted to give you. Um, so those of you that are here can answer, and you get to decide. <laughs> um, so the uh, the final exam, uh, it's been talked about with all of the uh, all of the pre-calculus professors because in large part we all have the exact same format, different tests, but the exact same format for um, what we do on the tests. Generally speaking, um, in times when it's not this, uh, we actually all have the same test, and we actually all give it at the same time. So um, it's it's a bit different this semester, obviously. Anyway, um, it'll be a, a, a three hour exam. So you'll have just three hours to take it once you've started it. And that three hours uh, will have to take place at within some three day time period. Um, so that's in this 72 hour period. Uh, that has not been decided for this class yet, uh, but we were given two options by the administration we can either pick 11.30, so that's, I can take out a calendar here. We can either choose those three days to be Monday the 30th through, this, through the second, Wednesday. So that's the early in the week of finals week. Or we can choose the latter half of the week, Wednesday to Friday of finals week. Um, I think... I think that's what was decided. Although now that I look at that, I don't think that, no, that's right, that's right. Okay, so it's, yep, it's either Monday through Wednesday or Wednesday through Friday. So I really don't have a preference, I don't care because grades aren't due until the 10th of December. Um, so, I mean, neither of these is right up next to that. So I really don't care either, either one, both of them give me time to, to grade. So I'll just go ahead and take a vote. You can, you can think about it now and tell me now, or you can think about it later um, if, you don't, if you don't have a preference right now. Um, but I'd like to take a quick uh, you know, poll, straw poll, I guess is what you'd call it, to see what your initial opinions. Would you like to take the final exam early in the finals week or late in the finals week? Anyone have an opinion? So that's three of us for earlier. So that's Nick's like, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, okay. I should add a third category. I hear early is fine. Okay, well, um, let's see, that's six, seven of us. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, um, great. So that's all of us here. Um, I mean, it, it appears as though it'll be early in the week. <laughs> but if any of you change your mind, um, it just let me know. Um, but it, it will be a three day period. So even if we do, you know, pick this early time period, which it seems like um, you could still take your test Wednesday. Uh, and that would give you all of Monday and Tuesday to work on it. But again, if you change your mind, then just, you know, shoot me an email, let me know. Uh, and I'll, we'll treat this like the real election for the president. Well, 
it's not over till all the votes are counted. <laughs> anyway, so um, so other things about the test, uh, it's going to be written. Uh, it will not be a web assigned test. Um, this was something that uh, has been discussed throughout the whole semester. Should we continue giving tests on web assigned or not? Um, for the second test, several professors did switch to written tests already. Um, because they did not feel as if it's giving an accurate uh, measure of student abilities. And uh, I decided to not do that just because that, that was my decision uh, for various reasons. But it has come down from the top that it cannot be on WebAssign uh, despite my autonomy. So I can't, I've lost my autonomy. I can't choose to make it on Blackboard. Uh, or sorry, on web assign. So it has to be written, um, which stinks, takes longer for me to, for me to do, and it takes longer for you to do probably. And uh, it's a little bit more complicated with how you can turn things in. So it'll be a three hour test, right? And Blackboard uh, allows me as the, as the, I guess, administrator of the course to see when things are downloaded and when they're uploaded, it timestamps all these things. Um, so what I will do is I will put it up as a, as a link on Blackboard, you'll click it and Blackboard will actually save that time. Uh, it'll, it keeps, it keeps, uh, it tracks downloads for me like that. And then you'll have three hours from that time, plus or minus, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, I understand that there's some work in actually getting it up on your computer. And then when you're done, you have to scan or use your phone to take pictures of, and then you have to create your PDF. Um, uh, that takes some time. So I don't know, I'll give you an extra five, 10, 15 minutes. I'm not gonna be a hard three hour time limit um, person, but if it comes back, you know, three hours and 45 minutes later, that'll be, I might write you an email about that one. Um, we can talk about this, uh, closer to the date. If you're not sure how you can do this, making a PDF of your written work. Um, so long as you have a Google account and you can use Google drive and make Google documents, or so long as you have uh, Microsoft Office Word, or so long as you have, um, uh, there's a whole suite of other things you could you could open. There's free Microsoft Word. It's called LibreOffice. You can do that. You can do it with this. But as long as you can take pictures of your test and put them into one of these word processors, you can always make a PDF from the from that. So uh, I can maybe I can make a video if you need um, right away. Does anyone? Will anyone require instruction on how to make a PDF? It's fine if you do, and, and I'm happy to make a, a video tutorial on various platforms. Okay, well, if you do have questions about how to do that, um, let me know and I can provide you with a solution and a tutorial for doing it. Um, the final exam will be over all the course material for the year. So that's everything from, okay, Nick. Okay, um, Nick, do you have Microsoft Office? Like Microsoft Word on your computer? Or a Google account? I think a Google account is actually the easier one. Okay, okay, so it, it, if you've got Gmail, then you've got the Google Drive and that has a word processor in it too. And I, th I think that's a bit easier because um, it's, well, it's free. <laughs> and if I make a tutorial for that, well, then anyone can do it. Um, so I, I, if that's okay, I'll do that. Um, Anyway, back to this. So the final will be over all the course material for the year. So that's everything from chapter one through chapter six here. Uh, well, chapter seven, actually. Um,
but just the sections that we've covered. So it's not going to have all the little sections that we missed. Um, additionally, there's quite a few sections here at the end that um, pretty much require calculators, right? Uh, the questions that involve calculators won't be on the, the final exam, just like on the quiz uh, and the tests. I've tried to limit it to strictly questions you can answer without a calculator. Um, on the last quiz, there were questions about, you know, finding the sine of an angle or something like this. And the, the answer was like three over root 34 or something like this. Yeah, you could put that in a calculator and you could get a decimal number for it. But WebAssign accepts this. Yes, so like this is a perfectly acceptable answer. Um, so questions like that where, sure, you could plug it into a calculator, I guess, but all the questions on the final will not require calculators and you can provide answers like this um, and that'll be fine. Um, if you have questions on the final already, you can go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. Questions? All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. So, uh, question 6.4 question section 6.4. So this section is on, uh, again, trig and right triangles. And I wanted to go over this question first, just number four. So it's pretty early on in the section, um, but it gets at a pretty key idea of, of what this section is about. And, um, it's about relating triangles and their sides to sines, cosines, and tangents, as well as their inverses. Um, and it, it can get confusing because you don't always know what you're talking about, right? Like when you see something like this, we don't really know what it's talking about necessarily. Um, or when we see the, the whole expression, we don't remember what it's talking about. And so there's there's kind of a, a perspective that you need to be able to obtain, that you need to be able to get pretty quickly in order to solve problems like this. Um, so my, my tip in questions like this is to try and try and think about what you're uh, working with. Okay, that, that's my tip is to try and think about what you're working with. Um, we're working with trig things, but specifically we're working with angles and we're working with ratios of side lengths. So in this problem, it's pretty, it's gonna be pretty quick to find out what the answer is here, but um, it's, it's not gonna be fast if we don't know what we're working with. So here we see this cosine inverse is our angle. So to find sine of cosine inverse of five over 13, we let theta, that's an angle, equal cosine inverse of five over 13. So apparently that's the angle, right? And complete the right triangle at the top next to the column. And then we find the sine of this angle. So, what we're working with is, of course, this angle cosine inverse of 5 over 13, but what angle is that, right? Uh, do we need to know what that angle is? Do we, can we find it some other way? Can we find the sign of it some other way? Well, this is where thinking about what you're working with is really, really key. Because we're working not just with cosine of this fraction, we're working with cosine and this fraction is we're going to sort of think about it as two separate things so cosine inverse of course 
relates sides of a triangle. So what sides of this triangle does cosine relate? Well, it relates the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. Right, cosine is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So do we need to, you know, find out what this angle is? No, we've got this result. <laughs> that uh, the hypotenuse is 13 and the adjacent leg is five. Um, so this is, this is pretty key, right? We're, we're thinking about what we are given. We're thinking about what the cosine inverse means uh, and how cosine its inverse is computed. Um, so we, we can quickly label this triangle. So now what is this third side? Well, that's square root of 13 squared. So 169 minus five squared, 25. Okay, and let's see, what is that? That is uh, 444, that's 12. Square root of 144, which is 12. So now we've got the sine of this angle. So here again, it's gonna, it's gonna help us to think about what we're working with. This angle, we don't know what it is, but we do know it's right here. And we know the sine of that angle, whatever it is, is just the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So that's it. Okay, questions on this problem? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. So question eight has us uh, sort of recalling information here. So this, is, this is again where it pays to have certain things memorized on. <laughs> so, so here we go. What are the exact angles? I can, I'll take them in degrees, I'll take them in radians, whatever your preference is at this point. Um, I hope you've started developing them. Here's the unit circle. For A, we've got Negative root three over two is our height. So what is the sine inverse of that? So that's A. For B, we're working with cosine inverse of negative one half. And for C, we're working with tangent of negative root three. And this is where things get interesting because root three is bigger than one. So this is down here somewhere. Okay, so what are our angles? Do we have these things memorized yet? Here's the angle for B. What is that angle? Oh, did I make a mistake for B? I did. I'll go back to that one in a minute. But for A, I didn't make a mistake. So for part A, sine inverse, so we're talking about the y coordinate, that's where I made my mistake, uh, for B, for sine inverse of this negative root three over two, what is this angle? It's 
AJ's got a good response there. That's right, AJ. He, he's not wrong. Five pi over three. That's if we went all the way around. You're not wrong. But Nick's got, I think, the answer WebAssign would rather have. Uh, it's equivalent to negative pi over three. Right? The reason, again, okay, yeah, okay. The, the reason we use this angle instead is because we're trying to fit the angles into some interval around the origin, right? We could we could totally pick all angles between zero and two pi to be the inverse angles. But if you look at the graph of sine, it's not one to one on that interval. So we pick a different interval, negative pi to pi to get a one to one interval for the function. Okay, so that's that one. Good job, you two. Um, let's now look at B. Maybe you can pick out my error. So for B, I wrote a horizontal line down below like this. Why is that wrong? It's not this. Why why not? So again, I'm asking why why aren't these angles the ones that B is talking about? So either this angle or this angle. Yes, Nick, well done. And AJ, yeah, more or less. We're not talking about sine anymore. We're talking about cosine. <laughs> so cosine talks about the X coordinate, not the Y coordinate. So here's the origin. Here's our X axis, positive X axis. Cosine inverse of negative one half is talking about angles that are at this line x equals negative one half. So we're talking about this angle or this angle. So either this one or this one. And if we can think about again the cosine graph for just a minute, cosine goes like this between zero and pi. And then it comes right back up when it, on its way to 2 pi. So we're going to look for an angle between 0 and pi, because in here, we have a 1 to 1 function, 0 to pi. So one of these we're going to leave out. So what is, what is this angle up top? I see two pi over three from Daniel, and I believe he's right. Two thirds of pi. The reference angle is gonna be pi over three, which means the height of this would be root three over two, and then the x would be negative one half. Okay, um, next question, C, is tangent inverse. Now I wrote it way down below earlier, but I erased it again because it's, it's a little bit different. We're talking about tangent, which is actually a fraction of the y coordinate to the x coordinate. So let's think about this. This is tangent of some angles, the same as the sine of an angle over the cosine of an angle. So how can we get root three? We can use things like root three over two. Divided by one half. I believe that gives us the correct value of radical three. And then we just have to make one of these things negative. So we can either pick going left 
and then up to give us the exact same angle as before. Or we can pick going forwards and then down to get, well, the same angle as the first one. So it doesn't matter to me. Both of these are OK. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll pick. Um, I believe we need to go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So we're going to go ahead and pick this one in the lower lower uh, well, quadrant 4. OK. And that'll give us the correct fraction. Questions on these? Okay, again, yeah, we're in the second chapter now working with sines and cosines and tangents, and there are certain angles that you should have memorized, especially by this point. Um, so uh, if you haven't yet made those tables of common angles, you know, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two, and then sine of angle, cosine of the angle, tangent of the angle, and then fill it in. Do that a few more times, right? That's that's really going to help when it comes to a written test, <laughs> for sure. OK. So now this next one's just a little bit different. Uh, instead of being given the exact value of that ratio for sine inverse, we're given some number x. We don't know what it is. In problems like this, you need to rely instead uh, on something you've memorized or instead of on um, a triangle that you've get, been given, you need to think about a sort of special triangle. Um, so if we think about the unit circle again, going back to last chapter, the sign always tells us the x, or sorry, the, well, the y value. It tells us the height, right? It's the y coordinate. So if we're given, and this is odd, some y coordinate that is x, you know, that's, that's at some height x. So if we draw our angle out to it, whatever it is, we have this. Now let's think about this triangle. Let's just drop a, a line straight down to the x-axis. We know that this height is x. What is the radius in this circle? In the unit circle? It's 1. Yeah. So can you tell me what this leg of the triangle is in terms of x? There's a, there's a nice uh, relationship with right triangles between all the side lengths. And it's the Pythagorean theorem, which says if you take some side, we'll, we're just going to call this A for a second. If you take A and you square it and you add it to the other side squared, you're going to get the hypotenuse squared. This is, this is what happens with right triangles with all their leg lengths. So let's solve this for A and figure out what it is. We'll just subtract the x squared over. We'll remember that squaring 1 is just 1, so that's 1. And then we're going to take the um, 
I'm going to take the square root of both sides here. So a is plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so that's really nice. Um, so what is the cosine of this angle? Cosine of that angle is adjacent side over the hypotenuse which is just plus or minus root one minus x squared. So a question in my head is, can we determine if it's the plus or if it's the minus? What do you think? The plus because A is going to the right. Sure, but that's just how I drew it, right? I drew it going to the right. Couldn't I have drawn it going here? Maybe I couldn't. Well, here's, here's something to think about for you. Sine inverse of x. That's this angle. Um, that angle is either going to be plus or minus, right? We plus or minus a positive or a negative angle. Um, and what is it? Where is it going to be? Sine of x, sine inverse of x is in what interval? And then think about cosine of angles within that interval. Maybe there's some relationship between between what between what it can be and what it can't be when you look about look at the domains. It has nothing to do with how I drew it. I, I just happened to draw it on the right. I grabbed two more questions like this just to, to just to think about and really to practice that Pythagorean theorem uh, method. Okay, we're looking at tangent inverse of x now and sine of that tangent inverse of x. So just like before, we're going to think about this in terms of that special triangle that we had before. So we've got some ratio, it's x. Um, tangent inverse of that is some angle. So we're going to go ahead and look at this like so. Here's our triangle. We know this hypotenuse is one. And tangent inverse of x means we're, we're, this x is the ratio of two sides. 
It's, it's the ratio of these two sides here, this one and this one. So here's our angle. We'll call that one theta. So that's right here. And the tangent inverse of x means that when you take the tangent of theta, you get x, which is a ratio of those two sides. Um, so we can call those sides whatever you want. Um, let's, let's call this side y. And we'll call this side something else, just like the last, um, just like the last problem, actually, it's going to be square root of one minus y squared. So once we decide what y is, um, we're going to have that. Now, what do we know about y and x? Is there a relationship? Yes. We know that x is the ratio of y over root one minus y squared. Right, so we know that for sure. Um, so we could actually do some fancy maths here to figure out what x might be. Um, questions so far? I know that these problems get a bit confusing. <laughs> so uh, let me take this opportunity to pause. Okay, no questions, all right. All right. So we will continue, if I can, there we go. So where do we go from here then? We've got this sign now we want to take the sine of that angle theta, which was the tangent inverse of x. Hmm. So where do we go from here? We can, we can go ahead and say, you know, this is obviously the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So this equals y over one, which is of course y. But what is y, right? Pretty sure they want this solution in terms of x. So how do we find this? Well, we can, we can try and solve it using a bit of algebra here. Okay, you ready to go with that? Here we go. <laughs> so we know we know that we've got this relationship there in red, in the top left in red, and we want to solve this for y. And now it's not as simple as just saying y equals x times root 1 minus y squared because uh, that still has y in it. <laughs> this, is, this is y defined in terms of x and y itself. So we're going to keep going. We're going to keep trying to solve this strictly for x. So typical, typical things here are to try and isolate variables on their own sides and to remove square roots. Um, we could go ahead and square both sides. Okay. Um, let's multiply this through. Let's bring all the y's to one side.
So we get y squared plus x squared y squared equals x squared. And let's go ahead and factor out a y squared. Leaving one plus x squared. And then I think we'll have our result here. We'll just divide both sides by one plus x squared. And then we'll take the square root. So x over one plus x squared under a square root. And we are going to have this plus or minus still hanging around after taking that square root. And so we found it. This is the sign of tangent inverse of x. So just going back up. We formed this triangle. We said the height is y, and that gives us the width is this by the Pythagorean theorem. From that triangle, we can find the tangent of, we know the tangent of this angle is y divided by square root of one minus y squared. And that's that tells us what x is. x is equal to that fraction. But we want to know this in terms of x, not in terms of y. So we solve this and we find that y is equal to this business. Okay, and now when we take the sine, we take the sine of this angle. It's just y divided by one. So it is actually just this. Okay. All right. Getting a whole lot of silence from everyone. So I'll just, I'll leave, if you don't say anything, I'll just assume you're experts. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I had, uh, sorry, the other part, tangent of sine of inverse is very similar. Um, make that triangle, use the Pythagorean theorem to find the other side of the triangle and then take the tangent of that angle. Uh, I pulled in this question as well, but looking at the time, I'm going to go ahead and skip it. Um, it's rather easy. Uh, you've got your triangle here. You've got your unknown height, and you've got a known two miles. Uh, there's, you know, this nice trig function that says the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite side over this which means if we take two tangent theta, we have our height function. <laughs> so you measure that angle, multiply it by, multiply its tangent by two, and you know how many miles up the space shuttle is. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. It, it's fun to think about, um, but not entirely difficult like the previous question. So section 6.5, uh, I had an email from a student here that wanted to know where this where this law comes from, the law of signs. So uh, I'm not gonna go into the full proof, but I'll give you a special special case proof that's rather easy to consider. Um, if you're really interested in learning more about where the law of signs comes from, um, uh, that's great. Uh, you're really interested in the math behind it instead of just the using it as a tool, which is, which is also great, but let me just think briefly about this with you. So we'll call this angle A, which means this side length is little a. We'll call this angle B. That means this side length is B here. And we are gonna go ahead and call this hypotenuse just H for a second, okay? I'm not gonna worry about calling this C and little c and this big C uh, because it's a right triangle. So I'm just gonna 
call it H. So this is a special case of the law of sines, just a special case. But what it does is it helps you understand the basic idea of what you're going to do in the general case. Um, in the general case, what you do is you create three new triangles from the triangle that you're given, and then you do this. So, so it's, it's an interesting example, special case example, that leads you down the right path to the full proof. So let's think about the sine of angle A. Sine of angle A is equal to the opposite side over H. That tells us immediately that H is, of course, A over sine of A. Right? That's just straight from the picture and definition of sine. Okay, now how about sine of B? Well, that's equal to its opposite side, which is little b, over H, which tells us, again, immediately that H is equal to little b over sine of angle B. So what do we have here? We have that H is equal to two different things, at least different in form. This H and this H, they're the same hypotenuse. So we know we can do this. A over sine A equals B over sine B. And that's, that's the law of sines right there, at least applied to this special triangle. Um, we could take reciprocals of both sides and it doesn't change a thing. The general law of sines says, this is certainly not enough space to, to put it, the general law of sines says for any triangle with side lengths little a, b, and c, and angles big a, b, and c, that the sine of a that the sine of a, I'm going to erase the triangle here that gives me enough space. Sine of a over little a equals sine of b over little b equals the sine of c over little c. Um, in our previous special case, we had c was a right angle, which means the sine of it was 1, and then the hypotenuse was h. Oops. And so you can see how this is the simplification of this. If we take reciprocals of everything, um, it's just a simple case of it. So, but this is very descriptive on how to do it for any general triangle. So I hope that answers the question that I had in the email, where this law of signs comes from. Uh, it, it, it really is just straight from the definitions of sign and whatnot. But here's how we can use it. Um, so in this triangle, we know two angles, 52 degrees and 70 degrees, and we know one side length, 26.7. What we don't know is we don't know X. We also don't know angle C yet, and we certainly don't know the unlabeled side length. So law of signs, um, you know, it, it's one of these one of these things we can quickly write down. If we knew the sine of angle C, we could take it divided by 26.7, its opposite side, and that would be equal to the sine of 52 degrees over X. And this is, this is really great because we basically have it here. We're gonna take the reciprocals of both sides or do this cross multiplication thing uh, and you'll end up with something like this. X is equal to um, sine of 52 degrees times 26.7 over the sine of angle C. And I claim that we have our results. That's it. 
the reason we have it is because we actually do know sine, or sorry, we actually do know angle C. Um, we remember that in any triangle on a flat surface, all the angles add up to 180 degrees. So 52 and 70 is 122 degrees plus some unknown angle C equals 180 degrees. So C is actually just 58. Now I'm not gonna plug those into a calculator because I don't, I don't care what they are right now. <laughs> X is equal to the sine of 52 degrees times 26.7 divided by the sine of 58 degrees. Okay, so it's a, a really nice, easy application of law of sines. Okay, we've got another one, and it's going to be exactly the same. So uh, we're asked for uh, just solving this triangle. So it's not going to be too terribly difficult. Let's call this x. We'll call this y and we don't know angle C. So let's figure that one out first. C is equal to 180 degrees minus 46 plus 20, right? C is just whatever's left over for the angles. So 180 minus 20 is 160, minus 40 is 120, minus six is 114. So there's that. And now X, let's think about the law of sines. Sine of 46 degrees over X is equal to, take your pick. Well, I think we need sine of 114 degrees over 65. And we can solve that X equals sine of 46 times 65 over sine of 114. Okay, similarly, we do this We do this with y. We say sine of 20 degrees over y equals sine of 114 over 65. This, this fraction is the key. We know both its angle and its side length. So the law of sines, we know that exact fraction. So this tells us, this implies that y is equal to sine of 20 degrees times 65 over sine of 114. I'm skipping the algebra there. It's just a bit of cross multiplication and division. Law of sines is pretty straightforward though, I think. Um, it's, you know, once you understand that sort of where it comes from, uh, then you can understand that it, it's something that's always true. Um, just It's just these fractions are always equal to each other. So it's, it's just something, it's like another tool in your toolbox, you know, another, another wrench or another hammer, a rubber mallet or something. Okay, there are other kinds of questions uh, in this section where you're told, hey, here are some side and angle measurements um, for a given triangle and find every possible triangle with these uh, that satisfies, uh, or that, sorry, use the law of cosines to, to find every possible triangle, right, that has these things. This one, you can solve this, solvable. Uh, I'm gonna skip it to go to the next one and find one that is not solvable. There's not a triangle that has these characteristics. So let's let's forget that I said that, and let's try and construct one of these guys. <laughs> so we've got an angle of 125 degrees. 125 is 90 plus 35. So this is like if I took a 90 degree angle and I added almost a 45. So let's, let's make it like this. So 
So it's like that, that's 125. Now the side opposite that angle, let's notice that's labeled A, is little a, and that is 20. Okay, and letter C, uh, it can be either of these other side lengths. Let's make it this one, 45 degrees, uh, 45. Uh, that's gonna be opposite some angle, right? What do we know? about uh, angle C. That's something we'll think about here. We'll just, we'll put it here. So let's write down the law of sines. We have the sine of C over 45 equals the sine of 125 over 20. Okay. So this tells us the sine of C is 45 times sine of 125 over 20. So this is, this is actually right where you are going to find your, your contradiction if you did not already find it up here. This is impossible. The sine of C cannot be what it's written down as. And the reason is angle C is acute, right? It's smaller than 90 degrees. In fact, it's smaller than 125 degrees, certainly. So the side opposite it must be smaller than the side opposite 125. This is kind of a key idea in triangles. If the angle opposite a side is big, that side is big. If the angle opposite a side is small, that side is small. But here we have the opposite happening. We have a very big angle associated with a small value. And we have a small angle, smaller angle, associated with a big side. That's impossible. We see that here because this is bigger than one. Which means you can't take it sine inverse. This is impossible. Okay. Were there, are there questions on that? Okay, we got about 20 minutes left and we'll go into section 6.6, .6, but just to sort of, you know, think about this a little bit more these problems are really interesting, numbers 19 and, and 21 that I've got here, and then other ones like them. And in more general, problems of this nature altogether, what minimum information do you need? To answer a question. Now forget mathematics for a little bit. Think about any random question that you're asked while staying indoors during quarantine <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> what is the minimum number of Google searches you need to do <laughs> in order to answer a question? In mathematics, like that's this is a very, very important question because you know you can always answer questions if you have all the information in the world, but no one has all the information. So what is the minimum information that is needed in order to answer a question? Um, or to what is the minimum number of information you need in order to say something is impossible or possible, right? 
it's a sort of a different take on mathematics there. Sort of a small category of questions to answer. Section 6.6, .6, we talked about the law of sines. Now let's talk about the law of cosines. Law of cosines, I like to say, is the Pythagorean theorem on steroids because it is so general. You, you just take the law of so, uh, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, you know, uh, let me write it in terms of A's, B's, and C's. So we'll take a right triangle, C, A, B. Pythagorean theorem says A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Isn't that great? Here's angle A, here's angles B, and angle C is our right angle. This is a special case of triangles. It's a right triangle only. But what if we changed it, right? What if this is no longer a special triangle? But what if instead it's, what if it's like this? It's any triangle with any three angles. Is there still a relationship between the three sides and the three angles? There is, it's a little different. Just gonna rearrange things here. Uh, I assume you've already studied this, so I assume you've already seen it, but um, it's, it's this, it's that if you take the side length squared, C squared, that's definitely equal to A squared plus B squared still, with a slight modification, we're going to subtract twice AB cosine of angle C. Okay, so this is, this is essentially the Pythagorean theorem, but it has been adjusted to account for the change from a 90 degree angle to whatever angle C is. So it's the adjusted Pythagorean theorem, um, or you can use my terminology, the Pythagorean theorem on steroids. So that's it. Now that we've seen it, maybe for the first time, maybe not, let's go ahead and use it in a couple situations. So here we see a triangle. Uh, we know two side lengths and one angle, and that is sufficient. So let's go ahead and figure out what we know here. Um, these angle or these yeah these angles they're labeled a b c but those are pretty arbitrary. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and relabel these things. Let's say this one is c okay and then these two I don't care I'll make this one a. I'm just gonna switch them. And that should be obvious here in just a second. So the reason I'm gonna do that is I wanna use this exact form. Okay. So I wanna say side C, which in this case is X, is equal to the squares of the other sides added minus two times the sides uh, 42 times the cosine of angle C. Which, since I've now relabeled them, is just 39 degrees. Okay. You can relabel sides like this. You can relabel angles like this. If there are several unknowns in your triangle, make sure you relabel things appropriately. Um, uh, so change angle to big C and change the opposite side to little C as well. Make sure things like that match up. Um, otherwise, what you can remember is <clears throat> in the law of cosines, You can rewrite it all these different ways.
the key to remember is that whatever this side is, you're taking the cosine of that angle. Side B, cosine angle B. Side A, cosine angle A. And another thing is, what is multiplied by cosine? Well, it's always two, and it's always the product of these two sides. Product of these two sides. Product of these two sides. So if you can remember these, you don't need to relabel. But if you just want to remember the first one, then just relabel. And uh, it's totally up to you. For me, I think it's a different case than it is for you. So I'll let you decide what you want to do. OK. Um, sorry, back up to the problem. I didn't finish it. We need to take the square root. <laughs> so done. The square root of that whole thing gives us x. Uh, and we're not going to take the negative. This is a side length of a triangle, so we're going to take the positive. OK, so I'm looking at the time. It's 9.09. .09. We've got another one, and we've got questions like that, and then a navigation one. Um, what would you like to see? Another law of cosines worked out, another law of cosines without a, a picture drawn. What would you like? Or something different. I don't have to do these problems. The one without the picture. That. All righty. Two, all right, here we go. So here's the question. Is this possible? Can you have a triangle like this? Side length A equal to 50, side length B equal to 65, angle A equal to 55. Is it possible? You said without a picture, so let's not draw one this time around. Let's just see if we can sort it. Um, here we go. Law of cosines would say, hmm, well, we don't know angle B. And we also don't know angle C. It makes this a little more difficult, right? But we do have this nice thing called the law of sines, right? Law of sine says the sine of 55 over 50, angle A and side A, is equal to the sine of B, which we don't know, divided by 65 side length B. So we could say angle B is equal to sine inverse of, I should not have put that here. So we could say that sine inverse, if this exists, of 65 sine of 55 over 50, we could say that that is angle B. Okay. So I don't numerically know what that is. I don't have a calculator right now. Sine of 55. Question is, is list less than one? Right? Question, less than or equal to one. If it is, we're golden. We know angle B, right? So I think, I, I do think in this problem, using a calculator is warranted, <laughs> unless we have some extra information. Um,
non-real error. <laughs> okay, it's, it's just a fake error. It's not real, okay. So that's, that's a problem. So this right here tells us from the law of signs that this is impossible. <laughs> well then, there you have it. You know, we're given two side lengths and we, we know that there's this relationship with the law of cosines, which says that side length C, whatever it is, equals 50 squared plus 65 squared minus two times 50 times 65 times this unknown angle. Uh, I, I don't know why I keep drawing two C's whenever I write cosine today. Cosine of psi, uh, angle C. This is what we would like to do. We don't know angle C and in order to find angle C, we need to know angle B. <laughs> So we try to find angle B, but can't. And I'm just gonna confirm with a calculator here that 65, that's great, uh, 55. Sine of 55 is 0.81 times 65 and divided by 50. Yeah, so this is this is actually right away, this is actually bigger than one. It's it's approximately 1.065. Which means we can't take it sine inverse because it sine only has a, a domain sine inverse has only a domain of negative one to one. So this is impossible. Okay. Well, we've got time. So uh, are there any questions? Let's press on. Maybe we can do this navigation one. Um, so this one's a bit different. I, I don't think we're gonna have to worry about this one not being real because it was presumably formed from a real <laughs> set of data here, presumably, but uh, application problems in textbooks are not necessarily full of truth. Sometimes like, sometimes it's like a bit of fake news here. So <laughs> here we go. A fisherman leaves his home port and heads in the direction of north 70 degrees uh, west. So that means he's, he's looked at angle north and he's gone 70 degrees to the west, 70 degrees to the west. So uh, that's just a, a term, bit of terminology, starting direction, change of angle in this direction. So if you've never seen that, there you go. Um, he travels 30 miles and reaches Egg Island. The next day he sails north 10 degrees east. So he sets out from the north direction, but he changes his direction in the east direction by 10 degrees. Okay. Uh, and he sails for 50 miles and he reaches Forest Island. The question is, how far away from home port is he? What is D? Another question is, what should his bearing be to go home directly? So south, some degrees to the east, right? We, draw a straight line south, and what angle does he need to go to the east in order to get the correct bearing home? So two questions, what is D and what is this bearing? All right, 
Well, uh, we're in the law of cosines section, so let's see if this one solves it. <clears throat> well, hmm. we know the side opposite of 50, uh, a 70 degrees rather, it's 50. We don't know too much else. I wonder if there's a way that we can find another angle or two. And I think we've got it by using the law of cosines, or the law of sines here, actually. So sine of 70 degrees over 50. Stylus is not responding so well. Okay, equals, you know, this, this angle, I'm going to call it D because the opposite side I labeled D. I hope that's okay. That's equal to the sine of big D over um, D. Well, that, that's not great. Let's, let's scratch that. Let's call this one B. This is what I meant to do. Sine of B over the side length B, which is 30. Okay, so here we have that sine inverse of 30, sine 70 over 50. That is equal to angle B. Now I know this one exists because 30 over 50 is less than one and sine of 70 is less than one. So this inside here is definitely less than one, definitely. So this is definitely an angle. And to figure out the bearing, we're gonna need to know what this is actually, but we're over time almost, so I'm not gonna fault, I'm not gonna solve it. But we 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 can use this then to say, well, D is equal to 180 minus 70 plus B. So you figure out what this is approximately with the calculator, you got it here. So D is equal to that difference. And from there, it's the law of cosines. Little d is the square root of the other side squared minus two times 30 times 50 times the cosine of angle D, which you just calculated hopefully here. So there's that. <laughs> okay. So thank you for stopping by today. Um, if you have any questions on today's material, you can feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if you have any questions over the final, um, I took a, I did take a little poll at the beginning if you weren't here. Uh, the, the test is going to be during some 72 hour period, either the start of exam week, that's Monday the 30th through Wednesday the 2nd, or it's going to be during the last part of the week, which is uh, December 2nd through December 4th, that's Wednesday to Friday. Um, I don't have a preference which three days it's in, um, but I pulled the six people that were here at the beginning and across the board it was pretty much people cared for the first three days. So it looks like, I think maybe just one more person has joined in since then. So, um, you know, think about that. If you don't really care, then we're gonna have it during the first three days of the finals week. Um, but for those of you that already voted, if you've changed your opinion or change your opinion by next week, just shoot me an email, okay? So thanks for joining today. And uh, that's all I've got. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you. You're welcome.